All right, welcome to the Bears Gym Bible Study today. We are in uh, Isaiah chapter 16, uh, continuing in our Old Testament Bible study. Old Testament has lots of good things for us. Uh, understanding it is not really part of the gospel, the good news of the New Testament when Jesus came to this earth. And, but he did this too. He did the Old Testament. Uh, during the Old Testament times of the prophets and the patriarchs and so forth. God dealt with people in the Old Testament like he does now, except they didn't have the promise fulfilled like we do now. So sometimes I refer to things knowing already the promise. Um, um, like I can tell you, give Jesus a chance. And it's the only chance you're really going to have to take for the rest of your life. and Everything else is by faith. I can tell you that, and it'd be true. Okay, when we're referring to Isaiah 16, because we're here in the modern times, and I look back at Isaiah, and I can say, it's the same God, the same person. Okay, so, but when we look at Isaiah, they didn't have all the truth that we have now. They didn't have all the knowledge that the con concept that they had was a little smaller than what we have, because... They didn't see the promise of Christ yet. Now we see the whole picture. We have the whole concept, the whole paradigm that was hard for them to understand. We have it all. Well, some of the things even we can understand is the e eternal realm, the realm eternal with Jesus Christ and our Father God in the heavens. And Isaiah, even though they were kind of before us knowing the promise, they had knowledge of the eternal that we still can't quite grasp because sometimes you see back in the Old Testament times, God appearing to Moses, God coming down and talking to Noah, you know, build me an ark of gopher wood, you know. God appeared to the patriarchs, you know. Um, and that's a, something that we don't see much, you know, God walking around down here with us, and he, but he gave us his word. He gives us his word, and if we realize it and read it, study it, keep it, we see him. He gives us his promise, the word of God, and as we take that dance of faith with him, that, that last dance that we'll have to, have to take in our, our human mortal flesh outside of God, we take it with him, and we'll never be the same again. That last dance in our flesh, and we become born again. And we'll never have to take a chance again because it's by faith, by faith in Christ. Okay, with that kind of platform, that building block, let's move into Isaiah 16. Isaiah 16, verse 1, and I am reading from the King James. If you're reading from other uh, translations of the Bible, that's fine. They're all good, in my opinion. Send ye the lamb to the ruler of the land from Silah to the wilderness unto the mount of the daughter of Zion. For it shall be that as wandering bird cast out of the nest, so the daughters of Moab shall be at the fords of Arnon. Moab. We'll talk a little bit about Moab. God is going to have mercy on Moab. God wants mercy to be shed upon Israel from Moab. Okay? God does give a judgment to Moab. Um, later we see that, that, that they were not, they were harsh in their dealing with uh, Israel. Israel later on, chronologically, was not open and receptive to Israel when they were judged, and God judges them for that. But we see here the, the beginnings of the children of Moab, the Moabites. Mo, the, the beginnings to the Moabite people was a uh, uh, was a very bad situation uh, around about the time of Abraham with Lot and his daughters. And then we have the Moab peoples kind of coming forth from that. And we see how they have some touch. We get later uh, chronologically from Abraham and Lot. And we get to the book of Ruth. And we see that she was a Moabitess. And so she, in a sense of the way, become part of the genealogy of the promised Messiah through the, the seed of, uh, through 
uh, through Joseph and Mary. She's a part of that. Okay. So here we have God dealing with Moab. It is after the book of Ruth, after the time period of Abraham and Lot. It's, we're way past that chronologically. And we see that Moab has the ability to exercise some mercy uh, upon Israel. And God wants her to do that. And she doesn't really fully do that. And uh, Okay. Um, verse 3. Take counsel, execute judgment, make thy shadow as the night in the midst of the noonday. Hide the outcast, beray not him that wandereth. Let mine outcast dwell with thee, Moab. Be thou a covert to them from the face of the spoiler. For the extortioner is at an end, the spoiler ceaseth. The oppressors are consumed out of the land. In mercy shall the throne be established, and he shall sit upon it in truth in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking judgment and hasting righteousness. Now, way back then, them reading this has a very modern flavor to it of their their era. It's like later on, you know, this is uh, Isaiah. Uh, later on when we get to the book of Jeremiah, that's, a you know, one, one to three hundred years later, this whole process of God starting to deal with Israel, bringing in judgment. Uh, um, then we're going to see them, their, their downfall in the book of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the minor prophets. We see Israel just spread throughout the Middle East and judgment. And there is a time where Moab is to reach out their hands to bring them in, bring some of their, their captives and protect them. But there's also a future sense, not only past the time of Isaiah, but past our time, because there will be a time again where Israel will be judged and they're going to be judged because they rejected the Messiah. All right? And God's going to deal with Israel on this earth after the time of the church. The church is going to be uh, rapizoed out of here. They're going to be, we're going to be caught up. If I'm still here, I'm going to be caught up. If I'm already gone on to be the Lord, Lord willing, my children will follow in my footsteps and we'll all meet together at the marriage supper of the Lamb. But the point being is we're going to be caught up into the heavens. God doesn't have to send the angels for us. We just, he calls, we come. You know, it's gone. We're, we're, we're gone, okay, off the earth. Later on at the end of the uh, tribulation period, God is going to send forth the angels, and which probably those of us that are already in the heavens, we, we might be, I don't want to chisel that in stone, but we were probably going to be part of the group of the angels that goes forth to bring in the elect, uh, the Israel that are in the heavens, on the earth, and, and wherever they may be, and gather them together. And which is different from the rapture of the church, you know, because we don't need the angels to gather us up. We just he just calls and and we're we're trans we're transformed. Okay, we're caught up together in the sky and we meet the Lord in the air. In the end, after the tribulation period, God sends forth the angels and he's gathering up is Israelis, Jews predominantly, it's very possible, though some of those that have survived the tribulation period, but not necessarily because he's going to gather them together at the end when he's going to have his throne upon the earth. He's going to gather the nations before them. That's what, what Matthew talks about. He's going to gather them and, and divide the, the, the lambs from the goats. So they're going to have their time, but the elect, God's people, he's going to physically gather together and he's going to send the angels out to gather them together for that final time period on earth after the tribulation period. Anyway, so we kind of see this prior to that. Hopefully I didn't lose you. I gave you a lot of information really fast there. But hang with me there. I'm going to try and dissect it all out for you. Prior to God's gathering in the elect from all over the world and the four corners of the earth and all that, Israel will be despoiled by the nations and they'll be ransacked again and they're to flee uh, 
into the wilderness, some say the rock city of Petra, so forth, to the Moabite region, wherever, okay? And one of these places is to the Moabite region, and wherever they send him, one of the places God tells him to flee to the mountains uh, in Judea. But one of the places they seem to be fleeing to is uh, to the Moabite region, and they're instructed to protect them, okay? before Satan lets loose the waters out of his mouth to destroy them, the waters being the warrior, the warriors of the nations of the world, the, the nations, the floods. God's going to open up the mouth of the earth and swallow them up. And that's, we'll get to that later when, we, when we're talking about judgment of God upon the earth during the tribulation period. We'll talk about that later. But Moab is to be used by God. God uses Moab to some extent. It's kind of interesting. God used the Babylonians. You know, this is going to happen a little bit later on in the very end of the book of Isaiah towards which is getting into the very beginnings to where Israel, Israel as a whole, this includes Samaria, Judah, uh, the, the tribes that were pulled off across the Jordan, um, they will be then carried away and um, we've seen a little bit of that here already, just a little, okay? God used Babylon. God used the Medo-Persian Empire. God used the Assyrians. God used the Greeks. God used the Romans to bring judgment and discipline upon Israel for their refusal to obey his word, his law that he gave them. They refused to obey. He gave them time. He was patient. He tried to correct them through the prophets. Many they killed, they beat, but eventually God intervened and brought great calamity upon their nation. Okay, so that's kind of the story of Moab. It's not like they're God's people, but God deals with some of the people in Moab. Okay, in verse 5 talks a little bit about the lineage of David. Be it David, David's son, one of his sons, one of the lineage, through his seed. But he, that offspring, or David himself, or perhaps Solomon. Some people think Solomon maybe didn't really deserve eternity, but who really does? I don't. God had mercy on me during my foolish years, my, you know, teenage years, very foolish even coming to the knowledge of the truth, you know, it didn't just lock in and create an obedience. I had some obedience and somewhere I was a fool. And God had mercy on me and gave me revelation and, and light. And same with Israel, same with Moab, same with the Arab nations, the, many of the Muslim countries, they are going to repent of that false religion and turn to Jesus Christ in the end times. He's going to have mercy upon them as he had mercy on me and possibly as he has had mercy on you. Anyway, and we see that of the house of David, someone sitting on the throne in Israel, judging with righteousness. And that will be a beautiful thing. Not necessarily that I'm a Jew or I just, that's beautiful because that's going to be like God's promise, God's hand upon this earth and the new heavens and the new earth. And I think we're going to see it in both places. But, you know, you can't chisel that in stone because sometimes the reference is made to the, to the eternal earth, and yet we know that this earth is going to pass away. And we're not exactly sure how that's going to transpire because our minds are finite. We're not, you know, infinite. God is infinite. He speaks of some of that stuff for us to understand, and we really can't comprehend it. But whatever it is, you can trust God to know that it's going to be good. Okay, there we go. Verse 6 of Isaiah 16. We have heard of the pride of Moab. Pride is disgraceful in the eyes of God. What does man have to be prideful about? Um, he's got room to be prideful about nothing. Uh, I sure have no reason to be proud. A little sip of coffee, hope you don't mind. It was a long week out in the work world, and now a day of rest for the bear. 
I enjoy a Sunday of rest. You know, some of you enjoy Saturday. Good for you. Enjoy Saturday. Your Saturday is your Sabbath. My Sunday is my Sabbath. I like enjoying a rest day. Some of you that are policemen, military, firemen, your your Sabbath has to be a Tuesday or a Wednesday or a Thursday. God bless you. Thank you for doing that for us. Nonetheless, today's my Sunday, and it's my Sabbath, and so I get to rest, and it's beautiful. And, um, it was a long week, so enjoy a little bit of Joe coffee on my day off. And um, In the Bears gym, we take a little break from bodybuilding on Sundays, and um, that's the way we do it at the Bear House, so you do what you like. Okay, back to Moab, pride. There's nothing to be prideful about, not your country. Not your children, not your own accomplishments. Have trust, have faith, have love in what God has done for you. That's all. What God has done in the country that I live in is God's doing. Not because of our people can really do it. There's a lot of great people around the world that have worked hard for their countries and they haven't had the success or the ruin that they're trying to bring about in our country, but nonetheless, there is a, a still a godly influence in the United States of America. And I'm not going all the way to the White House or to the Senate and so forth. We have corruption, sure we do, just like, you know, your country out there, if you're not from the United States. Yes, we have corruption, okay? But man has a sin nature, okay? And so, like even in the church, yes, the churches are corrupt, okay? Money's, money is like everything now. Uh, yes, there is, but they're not all corrupt, and not everybody in the church is corrupt, okay? Um, in our little home church, our little church of the living room, it's small and really, really inconsequential in the world, but it's clean and pure to the best ability that, in my circle of influence, that it can be, okay? And, but we're not perfect. We strive for Christ's perfection, his perfectness, but that's all we can do is strive for it because we never really attain to it because, you know, uh, I might say, well, I'm thank the Lord today I'm doing good and somebody might bring over a big box of donuts and I might walk back past that baby about five times and take a donut or two every time, you know, because I have no control when it comes to donuts, you know. And if we do that, we just got to hit the Bears gym harder, you know. So, okay, there we go. A little bit of, uh, what do they call that, uh, uh, comic relief. Just a little, little humor to lighten your soul a little bit. Okay. All right, pride in Moab. He is very proud, even of his haughtiness. It's funny to be prideful of your haughtiness. And his pride, his wrath, but his lies shall not be so. Therefore shall Moab howl for Moab. Everyone shall howl for the foundations of Kiriath, shall ye mourn. Surely they are stricken. For the fields of Heshbon languish in the vine of Sibma. The lords of the heathen have broken down the principal plants thereof. They are come even unto Jazer. They wandered through the wilderness. Her branches are stretched out. They are gone over the sea. Therefore, I will bewail with the weeping of Jazer, the vine of Sibma. I will water thee with my tears, O Heshbon, and Eliela, for the shouting of thy summer fruits and for thy harvest is fallen. Isn't it interesting? God weeping for Israel, even for Moab, when they are taken down. He judges them, and yet he weeps for them. Kind of interesting. In the New Testament... The Lord Jesus comes to Jerusalem. He looks over it and he weeps. And his, he's moved. He's sad for them because he sees that they're not repentant. Their hearts are hard. They refuse to listen to the chastening hand of the Lord. And he knows that God is going to bring destruction to them because he is God. He is part of the Father. And he knows that once he's brought back up into the heavens that he will have the unsightly duty of bringing the chastening hand of the Lord upon the country in judgment and despoil and destroy 
Jerusalem because they refused to receive their Messiah. But he's still sad about it. He's sad like a father disciplining or chastening his younger or older children. He's sad about it. People say, well, no, you're not. You're just mean. No. Biblical discipline and the chastening hand of a father, godly discipline, is of the Lord. And it must happen to bring correction, to bring order in your home. Otherwise, you have a rabble just going every which way, doing whatever they want. And according to the word of God, according to the statutes of the word of God, you must bring chastening and discipline, correction, into your home, into your church, into your family, regardless of the age, because you are the father. And as a father, you must lead your family biblically in a sound way. You must, because no family is without problems. And when the family, the problems come in, you must address them, okay? Whether it be love, whether it be chastening, correction, rebuke, whatever, helping hand, all of the above, you know, at different times, they must take place. Nonetheless, here God sees that they're going to be judged, and yet he's, he's sad. He weeps for them because he knows he has to, but he's still sad about it. Gladness is taken away and joy out of the plentiful, plentiful field and in the vineyards there shall be no singing, neither shall there be shouting. The treaders shall shout out, will tread out no wine. Their presses will be empty. I have made their vintage shouting to cease. When they're stirring up the grapes and stomping them, they're shouting and having a ball because they know that grape juice and, and, and wine is going to spread upon the land. And there's going to be rejoicing. But this time, the shouting will be ceased because God will bring it to an end. Um, we have a different type of wine. I think I talked about this before, and I don't want to hammer alcohol. I did this a couple times ago, and it um, has to be done. The wine of that day was not the wine we have today. We have impregnated our wine with sugar and, and alcohol stimulating effects to really bring wine is almost like a, a, a whiskey booze and uh, beer and all that. The alcohol content is so strong that it don't take much to be inebriated. You know, the bear hasn't had beer, wine, alcohol, whiskey, none of that for 25 years or more, you know, 25 or 30 years. Okay. And my, my life's clean. And I know if I had a little bit of wine, you know, my sense of it would be, you know, a little bit wobbly. And I don't want that, okay? It's not that I haven't had it in my life. I have. And during that time of my life, I've made really bad decisions. And I don't ever want that in my life. So I've made that choice to be clean, dry. I'm, I'm dry, you know. That no alcohol. That's the way I like it. What you do is your business. Uh, drunkenness is a sin. It will corrupt your Christian walk. It will corrupt it. Okay, enough about that. I'm, I'm going to get off of that one. Wherefore my bowels shall sound like an harp for Moab, and mine inward parts for Kiresh. And it shall come to pass, when it is seen that Moab is weary on the high place, that he shall come to his sanctuary to pray, but he shall not prevail. This is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning Moab since that time. But now the Lord has spoken, saying, Within three years as the years of an hireling, and the glory of Moab shall be contemned, and with all that great multitude, and the remnant shall be very small and feeble. And kind of interesting. When's the last time you talked to a Moabite? I can honestly say I've seen about as many Moabites as I've met uh, people with the name Jehoshaphat which means never, because I have never met a person named Jehoshaphat. Maybe it's a good name for a son. Uh, maybe if we had a son, maybe I'd, I'd name him Jehoshaphat just for the sheer novelty that never, nobody would ever get his name confused with another kid on a playground. You know, he called Jehoshaphat. That's a mouthful, and there ain't going to be any other kids with that name on a playground. So that's kind of a, a plus for the kid, but he may not like his name, but kind of a cool name nonetheless. But back to Moab, I have never met a Moabite. I've met Germans, Israelis, uh, Egyptians, Pakistanis, Hispanics from all over the world. But I've never met a Moab. So that tells you very small and feeble means very small and feeble. All right.
Hope you enjoyed Isaiah 16 from the Bears Gym. I'm going to bid you adieu. God bless until next time. We'll see you.